Uh, last week we talked about nematodes, <clears throat> what we could do around the hive on the ground to help control hive beetles. I'm going to give you the name of the young lady that you can order nematodes from. We talked about her last week and I'll give you her phone number. And my encouragement to you is, is to get them ordered. Uh, I don't know exactly what the date is. I think they're coming in like May 15th or somewhere in there. But you do need to get your order in as quickly as possible. Her name is Loretta Klosky, K-L-O-S-K-Y. She lives down at Chestnut Ridge. Great lady, she served as the B, B, B Club president for a couple of years. Her phone number is 417-343-8040. <clears throat> let me give you one more phone number. If you're interested in joining the B Club, Jasmine Bass, B-A-S-S, -S, I call her Jazzy. She's so full of life and energy, you'll, she's a joy to be around. She is the current president of the Bees Alive Club here in Nixa. Her phone number is 417-229-0837. I will tell you she's a very busy lady and she's a little hard to get a hold of, but if you'll leave her a voicemail, I feel relatively sure she'll call you back. If she doesn't, reach out to me and uh, I'll make sure that we get that connection. Let me give you my phone number. You're welcome to call me anytime throughout the season. And I always try to make myself available because I'm here to help you. Uh, my phone number is 417-761-4177. You'll not be a pest, so please feel free. I do hold down a full-time job, so if I don't get back to you right there when you call, I will touch base with you and get back in touch with you, okay? Any questions? So any questions from last week? I know you've had time to ponder this <clears throat> and think through what we talked about last week. We talked about you as far as your dress, the equipment you needed, and we talked about the contents or the components of the hive. Any questions before we get started today? Please feel free. Very open forum. I know I didn't do that good a job. Come on. <laughs> I saw an individual had a mouse guard mm -hmm. in the front. Mm -hmm. Is that something you'd recommend? I don't encourage it unless you have a mouse problem. And they do make mouse guards that are perfectly conducive for the beehive. Uh, sometimes mice can be a problem. Uh, once in a while you'll see a snake be a problem too. So. You always open your hive with caution. That's another reason I like the screen top. Uh, but normally, if you have a snake issue, he'll be down in the bottom. And typically, the honeybees fend off. If they're a good, strong hive, they'll fend off uh, by and large. Now, weak hives becomes a different scenario. They become more susceptible to a lot of different pests. And we're gonna talk about pest management next week. But mouse guards are, are great, especially if you have a problem because a mouse can really tear up a hive pretty quick. We talked about bears last week. Bears are an issue. This gentleman was telling me he had bears tear up a hive for him. Bears can be an issue for us as well. If they find a hive the first night, they may just dabble with it. The next night, they'll come back and they'll decimate it. Uh, the, the Department of Conservation, I think on their website, has a, uh, a setup structure that you can kind of follow with an electric fence to help protect from hives. And they're, they're, if you have bears in your neighborhood, my, my encouragement to you is to protect your hives because uh, once a bear tears up a hive, everything's pretty much lost. You just have to start scratch. The, the bees will leave the hive and the whole frame. Everything will be tore all to pieces. Okay, anybody else? Yes. Squirrels typically, I've not seen that problem. You don't have much space that they have to work with here. Uh, not typically, no. And we did talk about cattle and horses, protecting from cattle and horses. Anybody else? The last week that we're here, I'm gonna actually set up a hive, not a live hive, but I'm gonna set up the hives and kind of give you an idea of what that all looks like. Uh, we'll talk about placement again, it's a real it's a real integral piece of your beekeeping operation. There needs to be a little slant to it. So we'll kind of walk through all of that and give you an idea of what that's going to look like. I see your hand. Uh, can you 
discuss the frames and the foundation a little bit, the difference between the, you know, some of them have the wax. Absolutely. <coughs> so, uh, side note, we used to be everything you saw, my grandfather, all he ever used was a natural wax foundation. Uh, let me get a sheet of this here. Should be a little more prepared. This is what they, all they had to use in years past. Um, you see it's wired. This is a brood, brood sheet. It's wired because wax, when it gets hot, it becomes soft and it'll roll or wave. So the brood chamber is wired. And also with the medium supers, you can get it either wired or unwired. Now, why would you want it unwired in your supers? Comb honey. So a lot of people like comb honey, and you can't do that with wires in it. The challenge with natural wax is the heat. So I like comb honey, and I use the shallow supers for my production of comb honey. But I have to really be mindful of what the weather conditions are, because if it's 90 degrees or 95 degrees out, and I put a new super on that's uh, unwired natural wax, I know I'm gonna, if I don't get it put in the frames solid, I'm gonna have a problem with it rolling and getting wavy and soft. So that's one of the challenges to the natural wax. A lot of people that like to stay organic or all natural will continue to use this wax because it is edible. Uh, you can actually take this, peel it off and chew it. How many's ever chewed beeswax before? Absolutely, you, it's better than bubble gum. I mean, you can, it's actually safe to chew. So a lot of the organic folks or all natural folks, they still use that and they like that. In the last few years, and I'm gonna say 10 to 12 years, this plastic foundation has came out. In the brood chamber, it uh, actually has, has been really beneficial. Now there's some real keys to this that you need to know. Number one, the foundation needs to be wax coated. If it's just plastic without the wax coating, they'll not take to it. And I'll pass a sheet of this around. This is a shallow super sheet and lets you get a feel of it, but you can feel the wax on it. If you use it and use it, that's why they sell block wax if you need to re-wax them because over time or sometimes you'll get a hold of a sheet that doesn't have the wax it needs to have. It has to be wax coated. The nice thing about these is they stay in place. They don't roll, they don't wave. The challenge to it is when you use them in a super or a medium super, you have to scrape your honey off of it. You cannot, or if you have a, a, yeah, a centrifuge or a, a spinner, Extractor is the proper word. There it is. Got it. It might be a long morning. An extractor, if you break the cap seal on the honey, so every cell will be sealed, and you'll see that, you have to cut that seal off, put it in your extractor, and spin it out. The cell will stay in place perfectly, and it spins the honey out of the cell, and then you strain it into your buckets and then into your jars. So the plastic foundation has really been a real positive thing, uh, especially for brew chambers. And I will tell you the honest truth, a few years ago, I was in the middle of catching a lot of swarms. I think one year I caught like 13 swarms. When swarm season hits, it gets really busy. So I had had some hives that were ready to go, you know, brood boxes, I had them all set up. But I caught so many swarms that I got behind on time so I run to the hardware, and I always, at that point, liked to use natural wax. I grabbed 10 frames of the Plasticell, caught two swarms out of one walnut tree, and I thought, I'm just gonna test this to see. So I set one swarm in a natural wax hive, one swarm in a Plasticell hive, just to see who would do the best or how they would take to it. There wasn't 10 seconds worth of difference. They took to the Plasticell just like they would the natural wax because they're wax coated, they'll draw them out and they'll, they'll use them just the same. So either one, whatever your preference is, and it's totally your preference. Once in a great while, you'll see a hive that won't take to the Plasticell, but make sure that it's waxed. Anytime that I put a frame like this in a hive, 
I take my spray bottle with sugar water and I mist it both sides. That helps them take to it. It also feeds them. So with, regardless of what stage of the hive that I'm developing, whether it's the brood chamber, the first box, second box, or even my super, I will mist it down with sugar water and it helps a lot for them to take to it. So any questions there? Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You'll have to get you a block of wax and just rub it across it really good. Sometimes I see folks that want to clean these frames because they will, over time, they can get dirty or whatever. <clears throat> Hot water will clean them. Warm cup water, I don't know that I would use soap. I'd just use a warm water and, and scrub them a little bit, but you will have to re-wax them at that point. Okay? So, so the ones we buy in the store, we have to wax? No, these are wax coated. Oh, so this is a frame that was at the hardware. It's wax okay, coated. Okay, gotcha. Now, once in a while, you, I mean, always check that. Don't take for granted that they are. Because I have seen uh, some people sell the plastic cell that wasn't wax coated. When I was at the hardware, I never ordered it <clears throat> because it's just another step you have to take, and there's really no price difference to speak of in the two. Okay? Anybody else? All right. Any questions about last week before we move forward? Today we're going to talk about the hive itself, the occupants of the hive. We're going to talk about the bees, their social order, what bees are in there, and what this looks like. And again, if you have any questions, don't feel, feel, please feel free to ask. I want to take my time here because it's critically important that you understand the bees, how they work, what they do, and how they function. They're one of the most highly organized organizations that you'll ever see. If corporate America could learn from the honeybee, we would have a lot more uh, efficient world that we lived in, if I could say it like that, okay? On your table or in your chair, there was a sheet that says occupants of the hive. That's yours to keep. I want to talk about the queen first. She is the boss, basically. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the picture, you'll see that the queen bee is much larger. Now, when you're looking for her in your hive, sometimes it gets really challenging. If she's a young queen and hasn't grown to her full length and developed, she may be a little hard to spot. If she's a young queen, she'll be really nervous. She'll dart, she'll move fast. If you buy queens, if you can get them that are marked, uh, it's much easier to find her. Like this year, the dot color is white. Uh, if, you can if she's marked and she's got a white dot on her back, obviously she's easier to pick out. If she's not, you're gonna have to really look to find her, especially if she's young. A lot of the package bees that we get now and even some of the nukes, what I have seen the apiaries do is, especially with packaged bees, if you buy a three pound box of packaged bees, what I see these apiaries do, they go to the apiary, they go to their hives, they'll pull out frames, they'll collect the bees off the frames, they funnel them into a uh, big box, and then they divide them out into these smaller boxes. They have a bunch of queens that they're rearing, then they take a queen that's unbeknown to those bees and put her in that uh, box. So that queen more than likely is a young queen. She's not an older mature queen because they're rearing her uh, in their queen cages at the apiary. I'm telling you that to say that she may be a little challenging to find because she's young. Typically she's not grown out. When you see a mature queen she's a lot longer, she's uh, a lot more developed and a lot more easily spotted because her size difference is so different than the worker bee or the drone bee. So anytime you can get a marked bee, it makes life a lot easier for you. Uh, the color pattern on the bee on the queen can be all over the road. Can be dark, dark red, can be yellow. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason that I'm aware of to determine that uh, coloring of her. But she's a joy to find. If she's an older, mature queen, she won't even care that you're there. 
especially if you're if they're used to you being in the hive she'll just keep doing what she does once in a while she may try to hide or they may try to cluster over her to protect her but typically as a mother queen that's mature and i say mature she's been there a couple of years she's pretty well filled out she's pretty easy to spot because of her size questions yes ma'am the nukes will not be marked okay. i'm sure of that uh, it's a little different scenario with the nukes because they produce them early on in the season sometimes even last fall and overwinter them so that they got they've got time to build out most of their five frames and they're accustomed to the queen so typically those those nukes they're not marked queens whenever you go through the season if you have to replace a queen and you call to order one like I've used a, a draper in Georgia a lot with Italians. I always ask them to mark the queen and they'll do that for you, okay? The queen, what's her responsibilities? Basically, she, you can tell the distinct difference in her. Her abdomen is considerably larger. She almost will put you to mind of a wasp by her length. Uh, her stinger is barbless which indicates to us that she takes no part in the defense of the colony. And her tongue is considerably shorter than the worker bee, which tells us that she has nothing to do with collecting of nectar, pollen, etc. Her sole responsibility is the laying of eggs. She does not feed herself. The nurse bees, which are young worker bees, they feed her, they groom her, they take care of her. She's like a queen with everything at her disposal within that hive. Her responsibility is the reproduction of that hive by laying of eggs. And I think last week I mentioned to you that she has the ability at the point of maturity of laying up to 1,500 eggs a day. I mean, she's a great she's a great lady and she works hard for what she does she has my admiration that's for sure now one of the things that's critical about the queen is as she travels over and you've got a picture of a brood frame there as well as she travels over that brood frame laying eggs <clears throat> from her feet she secretes a pheromone scientists tell us that that pheromone has 24 identifiable chemicals it's important to know that because somebody last week asked me if i set my hive side by side will the bees go to the other hive the answer to that is no because that queen has her own distinct pheromone that's how they know which hive to go to they are in tune with her she they she is their queen they want no other queen they're very protective of her and they stay singly devoted to that particular queen the pheromone is the key as she travels over those frames she emits this pheromone that's how they know who and where they need to be now there's a real key to that too as well we talked a little bit about swarming last last week we're going to talk more about it this morning but as she emits this pheromone over these brood frames, what happens is, remember we said she starts laying in mid-February thereabouts? When we get into April, you think about the number of eggs she's laid that have hatched because it takes like 21 days for a worker to hatch. By the time we get into April, we've got a huge population of bees. So what happens is her pheromone levels are not strong enough to communicate with all of this bee population. It's one of the first key signals that this hive needs to swarm. That's when they determine that they are basically have outgrown their place and the queen is not giving enough pheromone out for all of these bees to detect it. So now we need to swarm. We need to split this hive, reduce our numbers, and the old mother queen needs to go on with the other half of the hive. That's really what triggers the swarming process. The key to that understanding is when they make their mind up to swarm, you just about can't change it. I've not seen a hive that I was able to persuade otherwise. 
I mean, I can do everything I want to. I can go in and clip off the queen cells, cut them off, and hopefully they'll go on as a hive. They won't do it. She'll keep laying queen cells until I give up and say, okay, you're going to swarm. I need to split this hive. So it's real key, and that's what the queen is noted for and what she does. Now, there's some critical points about this. When we get into swarming, I'll talk about her maiden flight and how risky that is, etc. But <clears throat> a queen should give you, a new queen should give you uh, at least four years. Scientists will tell us two to three years. One to three years is where she's strongest. Uh, I think the first year she's pretty challenged and she's learning what her responsibilities are, but between two and three, and sometimes if she's a good healthy queen, year four, she'll be a very strong queen. Now, the same patterns you see in her in the first year, when you look at this brood pattern, you'll see that it, it has a tendency to be a little bit spotty. What we ideally would like to see is a solid mass of brood cells there with just a real periodic hole in between there, not as many as what we see on this. This is a little bit of a spotty brood pattern. A young queen can be like this or even worse. She'll, be, she'll lay in one particular area for a while, and then she'll go to another frame or to the other end of the frame. She just really gets challenged with her behavior. An older queen will do the same thing. As she gets weaker, you'll see her become more sporadic. That's a good indication you can tell that she's got some age on her, she's getting older. When she doesn't do the job that she needs to do, the, uh, the rest of the hive will take care of that. They have a tendency to be able to manage and take care of their own. Uh, they will boot her out or they'll start instructing her to lay queen cells so that they can replace her. If you see that pattern of behavior in an older queen, you might take the initiative ahead of schedule and, and buy a replacement queen. Yes? Will you recommend rearing your own? Um, it's a great opportunity to do that if you have time. There is an art form to it. It can be done. A lot of people do it. You can do it. I'd study it through. The nice thing about rearing your own is it helps you a little bit with your genetics. Uh, although the maiden flight kind of throws that out the window. But let's say I have a mother queen that's been a jewel. She's just laid really strong. She's come out of the spring, busted that hive wide open with birth of new, uh, new worker bees. She's a great queen. Her genetics are really good. Yes, I'd like to have daughters from her. So yes, I would say you can rear your own and that helps you to continue the trait pattern that you see in that hive. And a lot of people like to try that. It becomes challenging trying to buy queens when you get late into the season. And when I say late into the season, I'm talking like July. These apiaries get so busy filling orders to sell queens that in the spring they can handle that. But as we get farther into the summer, that becomes less and less the opportunity. If you lose a queen in July for whatever reason, sometimes it becomes a little challenging to find a replacement queen. So a lot of uh, novice, queen, uh, novice beekeepers have started trying raising their own queens and it works fine. There is an art to it, but you can study it and go on YouTube and find a, a lot of different ideas and helps with that. Anybody else? Yes. Never a dumb question. Never a dumb Say question. You get your hive and your queen is dwindling away. They make the queen cells, mm -hmm. and you're not able to like catch it in time. And they make a new queen. Are they gonna just up and swarm and leave, or will they? do their maiden flight and then come back to that actual box. So they will swarm and leave because the old queen will leave unless you take her out. Okay. okay. Remember, that hive is dictated by her pheromone, the old queen's pheromone. If you catch this pattern and she's weak and she needs to go, you need to catch her and take her out. There's three days before her, it takes three days for her pheromone to dissipate in that hive. So when a new queen is birthed, then if that old queen pheromone is gone, they'll accept that new queen and should stay intact and not swarm. 
You really, when we get late into the season, I, I don't want to see my hive swarm after June 10th or 15th. The reason for that is hives, they've got to produce enough honey stores to survive the winter. Well, July and August, you know what that brings. Usually it's hot and dry and forage and nectar flow dries up or it gets scarcer. So it becomes a real challenge for a new hive that late in the season that is swarm to be able to become strong enough to get through the winter. So I don't like to see that swarming process take place by after mid-June if I can help it. And I have to stay on top of it to make sure. Sometimes you can't help it if a queen gets injured and, she, and she's booted out of the hive or she's done and they have to reproduce a queen. You can't help that, but you may wind up feeding them through the fall and part of the winter as a result of that, okay? Now, everything that I'm telling you is what we hope and want to happen. You cannot predict a beehive. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you, it's not like I can go out there and say, okay, girls, this is what we're gonna do because this is what the books say. They don't read the books. They have their own mindset. And again, we're not really there to make them do anything, although sometimes we do try to take that initiative. Sometimes we have to try to help that initiative. They, in, by and large, know how to survive. The, the honeybee and the tropical stingless bee are one of the two species that are reproductive and reproduce themselves uh, in a nest of 25,000 different bee species. So they know what they're doing. Sometimes, as beekeepers, we kind of have a tendency to think we might know a little more than them. Yeah, not so. But sometimes we do need to help them and give them the incentive or the direction because of scenarios that need to be addressed. Okay, any questions? Any questions about the queen? She's a jewel. You want to protect her. You don't want to injure her. If you find her, you want to be very protective of her. Uh, I do see people catching queens, and that's okay. You can catch her to mark her. There are queen catchers that you can use that are safe that won't injure her. And if you want to mark your queen, that's fine with a magic marker, white dot this color. The reason they, dis they distinguish colors year to year is for purpose of distinguishing the age of that queen. Okay, any questions on the queen before we move forward? The second bee we're going to talk about that you'll find in your hive is the drone. The drone is a male bee. When you look at him, you can see that he seems to be a little squattier, a little fatter. Uh, he's easily recognized. And by and large, they don't do nothing. They've got it made in shade. Uh, they don't do any house cleaning. They actually have worker bees that feed them. Their sole intent and purpose is mating with the queen on maiden flight. Typically, when I'm watching my hives for swarming, when I get into this time of year and I know that swarming becomes an issue, one of the first things that I look for before I look for queen cells is I look for my drone, at my drone population. When I see an explosion of drone population, that kind of tells me that we're going to see a swarming situation. Typically, in a standard hive, you, you'll see drones scattered throughout. I mean, they're not heavily populated. There's not a lot of them, and I can't dare to even put numbers or percentages on that. But you'll see a, a drone sporadically on a frame, maybe on a frame two, maybe three. They're just not heavily populated. But when swarming season starts, because they know there's a maiden flight involved, the queen knows that there'll be a maiden flight involved, the population of drones is critical. And we'll talk about what the queen does on maiden flight and why it's critical. But you'll see a little uptick in drone population, and that's particularly why. The other thing that I look for in swarming season is obviously the queen cells. The drone really does, doesn't do any stinging. They don't do any defensive piece for uh, the, the hive. They're basically, they're just kind of lazy chuck fat boys that uh, get fed every day and just get groomed every day and took care of until their one single job takes place. 
So you'll recognize them pretty quickly. They're distinctly different from the worker bee. Any questions about the drone? Real quick. Life cycle. How, I mean, do they have a short lifespan? Very short. So w when winter comes, they get booted out of the hive. There is no need for the queen or for the drone to be there through the winter, and they, there's no need for them to be utilizing honey stores over winter. So they have one job to do. They'll stay with the hive until we get into probably October, mid-October, and when they start, that hive starts downsizing in numbers to overwinter, the drones get booted out. So at best, they're going to have a year to live. Yeah, I'm glad my wife don't do me that way. <laughs> Any questions about the drone? Number one, she won't let me be that lazy, that yum it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the worker bee. And I want you to think about something. <clears throat> I want you to think about a hive that goes from minimal numbers and when I say minimal numbers in the winter, I'm talking three to four, maybe 5,000, 6,000 bees at best, to early June, late May, possibly having as many as 55,000 bees in that hive. That's a dramatic difference. When you look at a hive like that, there has got to be, for that many bees, there's got to be a very distinct social order to that hive. This is what is so fascinating to me about the honeybee. And this is what has intrigued me for all these years and kept me coming back year after year after year, taking care of these bees and loving being a part of what they do. The social network or the social order of that hive is unparalleled to any other insect in the universe. The worker bee is <clears throat> predominantly the key to that, and we're going to talk about her. The worker bee takes 21 days to hatch. So when you look at a cell, when you look at a brood frame like this, for example, there's a couple of things that I want to point out real quick about that brood cell. When a cell is freshly laid and covered over by the worker bee, it will be like a cream color, a real light tan. You know at that point, that's one of the things that when I'm looking for the queen, say when I look in my hive, I want to make sure I've got a queen every time. So there's a couple of things that I look for, and the first thing I look for is I look for brood cells that are really light colored. That tells me that my queen has been here and she's working and laying and they've took care of the business to cover that egg over and protect it not many days after she's laid it or within hours after she's laid it. So if I see brood that's real light in color, I know that I am probably still got my queen even though I still want to try to find her. As that cell ages, you can see the color pattern of these. It's more orangey. It'll even become more brown. That when we get close to that 21 day period where that worker is going to hatch, it'll be almost a dark brown or a brown color. That is some of the things that you'll take note of in your experience of keeping bees as you're looking at brood patterns, you're looking at the laying of the queen, the color of, and the same goes for a queen cell. If she's just freshly laid that queen cell, the coloring of that protective coating over her, that peanut shaped covering is a light, light tan. As it ages and a queen cell takes how many days? 16, 16 days, correct, thank you. As it ages, it turns darker and darker and darker. That helps you as the beekeeper kind of know what's going on in the behavior of your hive. Questions? Is the, the, the larva of the egg for the queen cell, is that different in size? It's totally different than a worker bee. You can see, you visually see the egg in the, the other one. You can. So if you're fortunate enough to look at a frame, when you pull a frame out and you're examining it, if she's laid an egg, it looks like a little white, really, really small piece of rice. You can see it with the naked eye. You'll probably never get to see a queen cell uh, 
with the naked eye unless you peel open one of the queen cells. They're pretty prompt to get the royal jelly in there and get that covered over because she has 16 days. But a queen, on the other hand, as she travels over the frame, pretend this frame is drawn out, the cells are drawn out, she'll turn and she'll drop the tail into that cell, lay an egg, move, lay an egg, move, lay an egg, move. I actually had the opportunity one day to watch that and it was fascinating. I just a luck of the day, she actually was, she didn't mind me being there and I had this frame up in front of me like this and I always try to hold my frames with the sun to my back so I can see better. The sunlight helps me. And she was traveling across this frame and dropping eggs into those cells like clockwork and it was a pretty sight to see. The bees will come back, they'll backfill it with uh, pollen or nectar and then cover it over for that cell to have its 21 days to hatch. So you actually can, you can, you will, and you'll probably get to experience that. Find a queen that has laid eggs and just a little, looks like a little white piece of rice in the bottom of that cell. Any other questions? Worker bee has 21 days. Al, any comments from you? You're an experienced beekeeper. So if you didn't hear Al's comment was some people like the black plastic wax coated. They'll draw it out. It does make the little egg a lot easier to see because the white against the black. But I'm like Al, I don't have a problem even with the yellow. I don't have a problem seeing the egg cell or the egg. You don't, we don't really at the hardware sell that much black for whatever reason. Oh, well, are we? Is it picking up? And last year, I had so many people ask me, so last year I put a hive with a yellow plastic cell, black plastic cell, wax, like that. Because everybody always wants to know, you know, like you said earlier, the bees like when it didn't make, it, make a bit of difference. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> okay. The worker bee, 21 days to hatch. The same goes true with the cell covering when they seal that cell. If it's real light coat colored, you know it's new. If it's darker, you know that, that it's getting to the point where it's about ready to hatch. The worker bee has a lifespan of about six to eight weeks. That's why it's so critical to have a good quality queen. It can make a huge difference in your hive if you've got a queen that's weak and not doing her numbers, your hive population goes down dramatically as the worker bees die off. And that's why she starts number one in February and she'll lay eggs up till probably, I'm, this is a guess on my part, probably up till the first part of October. When nectar flow stops, typically nectar flow stops at the first killing frost which in this country is somewhere around October 10, that's when things change in the complexion of the hive. Six to eight weeks lifespan. Now, what's critically important to learn is what the worker bee does. So here's some of the processes that the worker bee, when it's first hatched, when that worker bee is first hatched, obviously it takes a day or so for it to get its legs under it. They'll groom it, they'll nurse it along till it gets to where it's stable enough to work. It becomes a nurse bee. So it tends to either the freshly laid eggs or it tends to the queen. She'll go through that stage, she'll graduate, they graduate, they graduate. So here's some, of the, here's some of the responsibilities that worker bees have. Number one, you have worker bees that are scout bees. Scout bees are constantly out looking for new forage sources for the hive. Scout, the, the, the honey bee can and has been known to travel up to five miles for forage source, for nectar pollen sources. Obviously, the farther they have to travel, the less production you see transpire in the hive. So the closer the forage source, 
the more effective and efficient the hive is going to be. But there's constantly scout bees out looking for new forage sources. When you've got 50,000 bees working a field of alfalfa, how long do you think it takes for them to take care of that? So the scout bees got to constantly be looking for new forage sources. Then your worker, you have a worker bee or designated worker bees, and this will be the greatest. This will be the greatest population of the worker bee. This is where most of the effort is given, and they're out collecting nectar, they're out collecting pollen, they're out collecting propolis, which is sap from trees, and they're also out collecting water. Water is critical to a hive. Why? She got her on the money. When you get into June, July, and August, particularly July and August, that hive has to stay cool. Brood needs temperatures of 85, 88 to 95 degrees. I think that's right. Wait a minute, I'll tell you exactly. Maybe I won't. 88 to 95 degrees. When it gets that hot in the summer, they use water and they fan it, and the evaporation process of water helps keep that cool, a hive cool. So water's pretty critical to them. They also use water in different, I mean, they have to have water just like you and I do as well, but water's critical to the hive in the heat of the summer to keep it cool. They also use it to cool down and fan. Uh, they also fan their honey stores and get the evaporation process going on with the honey because it's 85 percent moisture when they bring it in and put it in the cell. So water is critical. So you have a number of the population they're out sourcing and collecting water, propolis, pollen, and nectar. Nectar is what makes your honey. Pollen is what they use to feed the young and obviously propolis is what they use to seal up the hive and you're going to find this quite fascinating when you get into your hive and they've been there 30 days you'll see you can't see a speck of light come through that hive because every seam is covered and sealed with propolis and Al and I were talking about it before class propolis is probably more effective than Elmer's glue I mean literally a, a, a hive that has had propolis in it for a long period of time it will literally, if you try to take pry a frame out, it'll tear the frame up. It gets that strong and that hard. So propolis is real critical to them, and they, they pull that from the sap off of trees. There is a segment of worker bees that stay in the hive and receive the foraging source that the worker bee out in the field brings in. So they hand it off. The worker bee out in the field doesn't put it directly into the cell. They will hand it off to a worker bee that's, that's their, part of their job is to take care of putting the pollen where it belongs, putting the nectar where it belongs, putting the water. They hand it off and then the segment of the worker bees in the hive do the transporting to the cells of what needs to be done. Uh, there is a population of the worker bee that is building new comb, constantly rebuilding and cleaning or taking care of new comb. Comb over time can get brittle uh, if it's not kept in the right environment and there's a constant need for the worker bees to keep working and make sure. If you put a, a cell, uh, a frame like this in your hive, what have they got to do? they've got to draw these cells out with wax. So there's constant, there's a population, a part of that population, their work responsibility is to keep producing new cells or taking care of the existing cells. They clean out the hive. The hives, they're very cleanly. Uh, they're very, uh, very efficient when it comes to keeping the hive clean. So part of those worker bees are doing that. Then you have guard bees that usually will stay outside at the front of the hive. And if you have, a, if you have an inner cover that has the hole or a top opening like that, you'll have a guard bee or two right there as well protecting that hive. The guard bee has a tendency to have a little more of a, a kick when it stings. 
I don't know why that is, but it, it, it is. So when I go to my hive and I'm going to break into my hive, the first thing I do is I miss the front. I miss those guard bees because I don't want them up on me or in my face or whatever. So I'll kind of either smoke them if I'm using smoke or if I'm using a sugar water, I'll miss that front so I can keep them busy with sugar water instead of busy with me. They'll protect and their job is to protect from intrusion. Uh, you'll, it, it's a particularly important in the fall of the year when wax moths become an issue or whenever there's a wasp or a yellow jacket or anything like that trying to invade into the hive. Uh, then there's part of the bees, the worker bees, their responsibility is to, hive, is to fan the hive for the cool of the summer. Question for you. Yes. If you wind up with a problem in your yard, your property, whatever, with wasps, typically what do you do about that? So you can put wasp traps up around the hive. Um, if your hive is good and strong, typically they'll care for that. They'll take care of themselves. They'll fend off any intrusion by the wasp. But in the fall of the years, when I really see the problem, because fall of the year nectar flow is is pining away they're looking for food source and that's when you'll begin to see hornets and yellow jackets and wasps at the entrances of your hive more than typically through the summer typically through the summer there's enough material out there for wasp and yellow jackets to feed on but when we get into fall it becomes more of a battlefield but if we do find a mud wasp nest or something up on the house we should get rid of that i would now, wasps are not a critter that I care for, period. I see no value in them, <laughs> other than trying to sting me, yes. You mentioned about the, the bees drawing out the comb. Uh, mm -hmm. I read somewhere about that the, it's the young bees that, that make the wax, and at a certain point they stop. How old are they when they stop making? That's a good question that I can't answer. Okay. Yeah, and I apologize. I, the age breakdown on the life cycle of the worker bee I've not seen any scientific facts regarding that. So I, I don't know that I can answer that correctly. Anybody else, any other questions? So you've kind of got an overview of what each individual species in that hive, what their responsibility is. And you can see how important it is for the queen to be there, for her to be efficient and her doing her job. You can also see how important it is for the worker bee to be there as well. It's critical, and the amazing thing about it is, is they know all of this process. They know exactly what they're doing. They know how to sign. Like this gentleman said, the young bees, they do a, the stage of building cells and then they quit and they move to another job responsibility. They all know that. That network and that social order is so fascinating to me that it, that's what keeps me so intrigued to watch how a bee progresses, how the honeybee hive grows, how it transforms from stage to stage as you go out. And as you go through the spring with your new hive, it's going to be amazing to watch how that hive is going to change and grow and populate and all, the, all that goes on and transpires in that hive. Any questions at all? What, what makes a queen a queen? Or how, you know, if she's laying eggs, then what determines what she's going to She do determines that. that. She determines that. She also determines the sex of the eggs that she lays. Wow. Yeah. So she knows when it comes time for that swarming process, she knows that she needs to produce a few queen cells. Some, some queens get crazy with it. I've seen as many as 21 and 22 cells in a hive. And they're usually around the outside of the frame? Or typically, not always, but typically you'll see queen cells down the side or hang on the bottom. Once in a while you'll see one smack in the middle, but typically to the sides, the bottom, once in a while across the top. They're a peanut, peanut shaped cell, totally different. You'll recognize it. Uh, but it's critically important that you understand what to do with it, depending on what process you're going to take for that hive at that point in time. Okay, uh, before we start into the social order of the hive, let's take 
a little bit of a break. Eh, no, let's don't. Let's keep moving. I, I'm losing track of my time. We're going till noon, so, so we got a little time. Okay, let me reiterate to you what I said last week. Albert Einstein said that if the honeybee disappeared off the face of the earth, actually he said if the bee disappeared off the face of the earth, man would only have four years left to live. That's how critical the bee species is to our society, to our environment, to our, geogra to our ge geography. There are at least, scientifically, we know of 25,000 known species of bees. Not all bees are created equal. And as I said earlier, the honeybee and the tropical stingless bee are the only two bees that are considered uh, perennial bee, where, meaning they reproduce themselves. And as you look at that brood frame you have in front of you, you know, the key to the reproduction is you see most of the brood is in the center of that frame. The outside edges are used for pollen and nectar sources for feeding. And then the outside of the hive, typically the outside frames are used for honey stores only, used for overwintering. That's how they produce themselves to be a perennial type species that can every year come back and exist and exist and exist. Now, there's two types of bees. There's a carnivorous and there's a herbivorous. And you don't have to be real scientific with this, but let, let me distinguish the difference. The carnivorous bee is like the wasp, the yellow jacket, or the hornet. While they do visit flowers for nectar and or fallen fruit for the sweet juices, and you'll see that how many have been around apple trees? The apples fall and have started to rot. Wasp yellow jackets are prolific. They're after the sweet juices of that fruit. Their primary source of food is what they kill and eat, and that is small insect prey. It's solely this prey that they feed to their larva or their young. So they feed on other insects, and distinctly, that's what makes them carnivorous. Herbivorous, on the other hand, are a bee that feeds on strictly nectar, flow, pollen, sweet juices, but they are basically, the honeybee is basically feeding only on nectar and sap and other plant secretions, meaning that their larva is relatively vegetarian. That is your distinct difference between the wasp and the honeybee, or the yellow jacket and the honeybee, or the hornet and the honeybee, which we predominantly know of in this part of the world. I lost track. There I go. So when we talk about the social order of the honeybee, the secret to their life existence, two particular strategies that we talked about, what are they? It's critical that you remember it. Honey storage away from the brood comb and the colony creation by swarming. That's what makes them so reproductive. Working in their uh, hive is so critical as far as the social order and the networking of what they do. It keeps everything ticking and moving like clockwork. Any questions up to this point about what we see inside the hive? In the wild, have you captured swarms in the wild before? What, what does it appear like inside of a hollow tree? Or so, yes, and Honestly, there's no rhyme or reason to what you'll see. Uh, you'll see honeycomb, even if you get into the eave of a house, or if you get into the wall of a house, you'll see strands and strands and strands of honeycomb built out, and they'll see 
you'll see the same case scenario. You'll see brood, a lot of brood. You'll see a lot of honey stores. And, you, and you'll see the same survival mode in those particular places that you would see inside here. Uh, it's challenging when you get into trees and you get it because the queen becomes really hard to find. And if they've been there for a long time, I mean, unbelievably, I, I read a story about a guy in Texas two years ago that got into the flooring of a house and these bees had been there so long that there were literally was eight colonies, eight separate queens existing in that floor, operating in that whole floor. I mean, it was massive. And when the guy that was the beekeeper, when he began to pull these out, he caught eight different swarms of bees in that solid flooring. They had been there for years. And that's just how they continue to survive and exist. It was fascinating to see pictures of it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. If they have eight swarms of bees, is there over two queens to a hive? So there were eight different queens in that particular scenario, and I'm sure there was had to be a fine point of separation because the pheromones so critical with each hive, so they, they've had to learn how to exist. To further answer your questions, I have on rare occasions seen two queens in one hive. Very rarely, a mother and daughter queen coexist. It's very rare. But once in a great while, you can see that happen. Uh, in a hive this size where the room is so limited, my guess would be that they won't stay long that way. But, yeah, but I have seen that opportunity. So the queen being that large, she can swarm, she can still fly up to five miles? To she can fly, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. When you open the hive and you actually see your queen, is there any kind of protection that you should take to keep her from like trying to fly away? I would be really careful with her, yes. If she's a young queen, she might have a tendency to take off and fly. The thing you need to understand about a queen is she's very, she's very loyal to her young. If she's an older queen, she's not going to leave her young. She just will not. That's why it becomes so difficult to get a queen out of a tree or out of a place where, like an eva of the house or the wall of the house. She'll hide until you find her and literally take her out or smoke her out. And she has, she'll take a lot of smoke before she leaves. But an older queen, I don't worry so much about her. I'm cautious with her to protect her. So if I see her on this frame, yeah, I'm really careful about putting this frame back into my hive, and I don't, I don't dilly-dally with it out in the open air, because I don't want to give her that opportunity. A younger queen becomes a little more risky. I mean, they're, they're very unpredictable. They'll be moving and darting, and you might see her on the bottom of this side, and in a second she'll be on the other side. She, she's the one I get, become a little more nervous about, about maybe taking a flight and leaving. Do you have a process when you're removing the frames? Do you, mm -hmm. you, you take one and then make room? Mm -hmm. okay. And we'll talk about that the last session, yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, if you are going after a swarm that's established in a tree and you're able to locate the queen, how do you then trap it to that? So you want to catch her. They make queen catchers. <clears throat> you want, And if you catch her, you can do anything you want to with that hive, basically. And I take her, and I, I don't let her out of that cage, but I'll put that cage down in that new hive, and they'll find her. They'll find her pheromone. She will beat her drum, and they'll find her. How long do you leave her in the cage? Let her out? Depends on the, excuse me, depends on the kind of cage you have to catch her with. Um, I like to make sure that they're going to stay. So if it's overnight, maybe a day or two, I don't want to leave her in that cage so long that they can't feed her properly and take care of her properly like they should. But a 24-hour period, 
if if you feel comfortable that they're going to stay there and they've adapted and the way you'll know that is if they're spread out throughout that hive and they're working that's a pretty good indicator that they're settled then you can release her and let her go to work doesn't mean she'll always stay it and once in a while they won't just like it and they'll take off it helps if you can and I've actually took brood frames. I've took the plastic cell out and I'd cut out the section of that and I'll put rubber band around this to hold it in there. It does make a little difference, a lot of difference. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, let's take a break. Let's take about 10 minutes. I've totally lost my thought processes here and I need to regroup and we'll go into uh, swarming and some other things.